Hello, my name is Darren Thomas and I am the Director of Educational Research Techniques. In this video, we're going to learn about what exactly is a research problem and the traits and characteristics of a research problem, particu particularly in the context of quantitative research. So let's go ahead and see what we can learn. Now, as you remember from the prior video, research begins with a problem basically. You really want to try to hone down exactly what it is that you're going to try to study. Now, what makes that challenging is it is not easy to shape and define a research problem. Matter of fact, this is probably the most difficult aspect of the research experience in terms of trying to shape whatever it is you want to know more about. And so I could give you lots of different definitions of what a research problem is. But basically, to make it as simple as possible, you are looking for a specific issue or some sort of concern that you are convinced needs to be studied. Now, when you begin writing, you are going to have to try to sell and convince the audience that your problem is something that is worth looking into. But that's a separate problem from right now. In this video, we're going to focus on how you can convince yourself <laughs> that you essentially have a problem that is researchable. Now, there are different criteria for, for a research problem. And you know, no two researchers are going to agree on the criteria. I need to explain that. But here are some that I've noticed over the years. First one is going to be accessibility. In other words, you are able to actually study the problem. This is actually a lot more challenging than you can think because students, especially when they're new to the research experience, they often have overly ambitious dreams and ideals of things they want to study that they're not quite equipped for yet. And they may not have access to the people who need to be a part of that study, or they might not have access to the tools or whatever it is that they need to make that happen. And this brings me to a, a a relevant or not relevant but a related point that's almost the same and that is resources so you have to make sure you have the tools to get the job done so for a long time it was very difficult to do complex analysis because you know students might be limited to Excel um, on their computer and they didn't have things like R and Python at, in those days so you couldn't do a lot of fancy analysis during the, during that time unless you had access to like SPSS or something else. And so this would limit what you were able to do as a researcher, especially I'm always making these videos primarily for students who often have much more limited resources than say an academic professor. And so you also, when you are looking at things you want to study, do you have access? In other words, like to the population as an example, um, if you want to deal with children, there could be challenges with access. Parents may not want you asking their kids questions about some of the things that you're interested in. Also with our second bullet here, resources. You may not have the appropriate tools to do it, to, to pull it off. So as another example, if you want to do like an online survey, again, thinking 20, 30 years ago, you know, they didn't have uh, Google surveys or Google forms at that time. And so doing online surveys was either through Qualtrics or pretty much you were out of luck. Now things have changed, but if you needed Qualtrics, you know, you had to have financial resources for that. And that could be a challenge. Another thing, and this is where it gets really, really fuzzy. These are kind of black and white. Either you can get access or you can't. Okay. We're not going to deny that. If you have the resources or you don't, but another one is worthiness. Okay. In other words, are you doing something that makes a contribution? Another word for this might be, you know, the significance of your gap, your research gap, you know, your contribution to the field, if you will. Um, you know, but this is where it's fuzzy. This is more subjective. Does your problem, you know, is it weighty? Is it like something that's going to be interesting? Something that people are going to want to think about, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> That is another critical aspect of the, trying to identify if your research problem is, you know, going to be useful or maybe not so useful. 
And another one, of course, this is related to worthiness, is informed practice. Does your research problem improve something? Informed practice. You know, this is coming from an, an education background. We're always trying to improve our teaching, our assessing, whatever. So does your research problem, as you continue to explore this, can it lead to some informed practice, helping people to do things better? And so again, no, no two researchers are going to agree on the criteria of what makes a research problem a, you know, a potential research problem. But these will at least get you started. And as you mature in this process, you will of course make your own criteria, modify this one, add to it, whatever. But the point is, is that when you are a student, we you know we have to get you going with something. And so these four ideas here will help you to get started in your actual research experience. Now, something else that we have to be concerned about, and that is, and that is going to be whether or not your research problem is quantitative. Again, this is also very, very important because students really, really struggle with trying to determine what it is they're trying to measure or what it is they're trying to actually put numbers to it as, as an example. And so when you are thinking about your research problem, you have to make sure you have variables in there. And these have to be variables that you can't obviously measure. If you can't measure them, they're not variables in your situation. So, you know, height, weight, income, those are all things that can clearly be measured. If you want to look at people's perceptions, like your scales, that's another way to approach that. And so this is especially true, you know, obviously if you're doing a descriptive study, or a correlational study. Again, we'll talk about research designs later, but these are things that you have to really make sure that are lining up. Something else that's important is, you know, if you're going more in the experimental direction, it's experimental design, you have to try to make sure, okay, what effect am I trying to assess? So again, what are you going to, what is going to be like your independent variable? What's going to be your dependent variable? How are you going to manipulate it to see how it affects the dependent variable? What are the controls you're going to put in place? These are all things that you're not going to have them obviously determined at the beginning of your research experience, but these are the kind of questions that your advisor and your teachers are going to be asking you and you're going to be stumped because you hadn't really thought these things through at all almost done here. Also, when you are trying to develop a quantitative research problem, which is the focus of this video, you have to make sure that you're trying to develop and test some sort of a theory. And this will make more sense when we talk more later, but basically a theory is trying to explain something that's happening in the, the real world, some sort of a phen phenomenon. Again, I'm kind of flying past the philosophical parts of research because students do not seem to appreciate that as much. But essentially what you're doing is that you are studying something that happens in the real world and you are going to use numbers to try to understand and explain that action, behavior, phenomenon, whatever it is. You know, you might be looking at academic performance, you know, as it correlates with, you know, sleep or whatever, or you might be looking at, um, you know, students' health in relation to income levels or whatever. You are studying something that is existing in the world and you're, and you're using numbers for that purpose. So basically when you're testing your theory, what you're doing is that you're trying to um, test the hypotheses that make up the theory. Again, obviously I can't share everything in a 10 minute video, but these hypotheses are basically your beliefs about these phenomena that's this phenomenon that's happening in the real world and you test these hypotheses to help to shape the theory which is basically where you're trying to explain what's happening there again i know that's really abstract sorry about it and the last one is that you want to make sure that your that your problem that as you are interpreting the results or whatever that you're able to generalize it and this is where we're going from generalize, I want to spell this right. This is where we're going from your sample, what you learned in your sample to being able to extend and to apply what you learned 
you know, in general, okay? Now often, again, this is where students really struggle because their sampling might not be as accurate as you would hope for and they were not as careful with that. But these right here, these four ideas help to confirm for you, again, when you're trying to talk to your advisor, when you're trying to convince people that your research problem is quantitative or it involves the use of numbers. Now, again, I have to be careful and state that everyone's not going to agree with this, these ideals presented here. However, this will get you started. You might realize that some of these work better for you than others, that maybe you need to add to this list, but when you are at the beginning of a project and you are an inexperienced student, this will get you going. And you can develop and remove and add to this list as you see necessary when you grow as a researcher. And so this is what I wanted to cover in this particular video. In a future video, I might give you examples of research problems. One other thing I want to mention is that when you are trying to share your problem, you're also trying to justify it. And that involves using statistics and you know stories to illustrate that there really is a problem out there. This is, this is one of the first things you do at the beginning of, if you're writing an article, you know, the, the first paragraph or two, or if you're doing like a dissertation or thesis, this will be like the first couple pages where you lay out how, hey, this is happening, this is happening, this is a problem. We need to study this. And I will show you examples of that at a later time. So to wrap up this video, we basically discuss two things. On this first little slide right here, I gave you some tips on how to um, determine if your problem is, is a research problem. And so you have to keep in mind these four uh, characteristics here. Access to whatever you need, resources, worthiness, and does your problem inform practice. If you can check off these boxes, you probably will be much closer to having your teacher accept what you want to study although they probably will still have more advice and counsel to give you in addition to these uh, four criteria right here. The second half of this video, video, we looked at how to determine if your research problem is quantitative. We've been focusing on quantitative research. And so, of course, you got to make sure you have variables there uh, that you are, uh, it assesses an effect if you're doing experimental, so assesses here assesses an effect, uh, you're testing a theory and you're able to generalize it. And so these four traits here, this is what helps to confirm in your own mind that your problem is quantitative, that your research problem is quantitative in nature. So there's much more that could be said about this, but this is enough for you to begin your journey. So for now, my name is Darren Thomas. I am the Director of Educational Research Techniques. Thank you so much for watching and you take care.